Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the chatty astronomy <laughs> podcast where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the hosts are fundamental. Is that we, like, I, don't know. I don't think so. We're made up of particles. That's like the science no, version of No, we are basic. not. We are Strange Charm and Top, the Astro Quarks. That's true. They are fundamental. Also known as Josh Caldwell, Addie Dove, and Jim Cooney. Coming to you from the Walkabout Studios at the University of Central Florida. Be sure to stick around at the end of the episode to hear Addie's word of wisdom. <laughs> Our stumpers are celestial phenomenological. <laughs> any, mm-hmm. any, any issues with that, Jim? <laughs> yeah. But Phen- phenomenological? That's a word. Okay. Celestial is a word. Phenomenological is a word. There you go. But uh, not together. Celestial phenomenological? <laughs> Hyphenated, maybe. <laughs> okay. That'll so, buy. All right. It doesn't fit on a Scrabble board. C- celestial hyphen phenomenological. It probably doesn't fit on a Scrabble board. Phenomenological does. How long, how, what's the dimensions of a Scrabble board? 15 by 15. Okay. Jim, your stumper has nothing to do with Scrabble. Okay. It's not, it wouldn't be a stumper if it did. <laughs> That's true. It would be easy for him. Meteor storm or tropical storm. This is a tough one because I thought, I thought it, I hoped yeah. it might be because <laughs> I love them both. I'm gonna I'll go with Meteor Storm because so I've never seen one and I really want to. Because it's an astronomy podcast. And it is an astronomy <laughs> podcast, but uh, tropical storms are uh, astronomy adjacent. Yeah, you know they're they uh, happen they're, on a planet. They're weather planet. things, and the, yeah. Uh, and I love tropical storms. It's one of the great things about living in Florida. I mean, there's there are some bad things, but some great things. Tropical weather, though. I don't like when it hurts people or property. Uh, the The power of weather is awesome, so I really enjoy tropical storms. But I want to see a meteor storm so bad. Like you've meteor never storm, seen a meteor. I mean, I've seen meteor shower. showers, but meteor storm. I mean, there's no like strict definition for the meteor, meteor storm. Is. Usually, is a very you know a, a very active meteor shower where you see some large number, a thousand meteors an hour or something like that. Lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I've never seen. One like that, uh, you know. You, I've gone, I've gone out and seen them where you know you, you lie down and you see one a minute or something like that. It's still pretty cool. That's I enjoy it, impressive. but I've never seen the you know seeing many, many, many a minute. I want to see like that, that. Yeah. but without those sound effects. With exactly yeah, with those, those sound, sound effects. effects. Oah because you're making them. <laughs> yeah, well, I will be making them while they're happening. <laughs> well, remind yes. me not to yes. watch it with you then. I might also. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I I have a feeling there is a, yeah. a strict, you gotta have sound effects. I have a feeling there may be a strict definition for meteor storm, like really? more than something like what you said, a thousand per hour or something like right. that, uh, to qualify. Has as there a been a storm. movie called Meteor Storm yet? Yes. No. Have there? What? Earlier today, I was I googled the term meteor storm. Just randomly. And the thing came up. Well, because I was trying to think of a, a trivia for today. Mm. Our trivia today is not related to a meteor storm, but uh, I, googling that, I found. The first thing that popped up was the movie Meteor Storm. Really? What? Which I have not seen. I don't know what it was. When, when is, is it from? from? I don't know. Oh, oh I guess that's. Not I, I, it just pissed me off because I, uh, you know, you just it, it just went to that immediately, and I was like, that's not what I want. So I immediately. Twenty ten. Meteor Storm. The, the movie Meteor Storm. Uh huh. Huh. I guess we have homework. Go watch I've seen the movie Geo Meteor Storm, Storm, which is awful, but not okay. a Meteor Storm. All right. Well, <gasps> guess what? Guess which major city is the target. Of meteor storm, mm-hmm. New York Los City. Angeles. You have, like, you're close. San Francisco. San Francisco. San Francisco. Oh man, yeah. it's always, always beat up. It's on. always San Francisco, London, New York. Yes, they have the big landmarks that you can right. throw things into. Astronomical events. Mm-hmm. Never, Target. They never land in the Great Plains <laughs> no, or, or the in the ocean, ocean, which covers <laughs> most of the Earth, except in the Great <laughs> Deep uh, Impact. I, I right. didn't know you were going to say that movie. Yes. Uh, Addie, yes. speaking of Deep Impact. Okay. Daytime Comet mm-hmm. or Nighttime Supernova? Nighttime Supernova? Bass. Okay. I think Nighttime Supernova. Okay. Um, daytime Comet is super cool, but I feel have, like... I've ne- I don't think we've seen one, have we? We have... I, well, there was... What was the one... This would be a comet that you could see... Actually see... In the daytime, yeah. naked eye. Yes, yes. Which, like, comets are sort of hard to see naked eye, nighttime even. So I feel like there was one in our there lifetime was that was, like, in, like the 90s. it was way more visible in the southern hemisphere. What am I yeah. thinking of? Maybe it's Hayakatuki. That's Hayaka- what I was going to say. Hayakatuki. Uh, so, Hayakatuki was uh, okay, very, very wrong. big. I'm sure we're saying it wrong. Probably. I saw it. That was in 95 or 96 because yeah. I was living in France at the time. Oh. And one night, you could go out and see, and it was huge. It was very close, but it was very faint. You couldn't see that one during the day? 
I did at least mm. did not see it during the day. I could see a very faint tail. I lived kind of out in the countryside, so it was a dark sky and it was very faint. And I was like, wow, I can't believe how big that is. It was just covering a huge swath of the sky. And Comet hale bopp I think, has been the sort of best northern hemisphere, at least, uh, comet that I remember like really just being able to go outside and like, oh, there's a comet right. in the sky. That was kind of incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, a, that was an awesome comet. Uh, and you could have done daytime comet or daytime supernova too. I think what I'm thinking I think of, I was trying to make it a tougher stumper because a daytime supernova has got to win out over a daytime comet. But I don't think, you think it wins out at night too, right? Because it's just also that's well, way more rare. Even yeah. though comets are pretty rare, they're both pretty rare. All right. Comet McNaught, that's the one I was thinking of. I think oh. Comet McNaught was daytime visible. Is that MC subscript zero? Yes. McNaught. <laughs> <laughs> it's spelled that way. Two thousand six P one. Capital N. I don't think I ever heard of that one. Really? I remember that one. Because it was, it, I think it was way better for the Southern Hemisphere. Okay. It was very close to, but, what, but, yeah, I feel like maybe. But it was crazy. It was visible in the yeah. daytime. Crazy. Well, I don't, I personally have never seen a daytime comet or a nighttime supernova. I'm still oh. going to go with supernova. But keep looking up every night. Or a meteor storm. For Beetlejuice. But today we will be talking about meteor showers. None of those. <laughs> sort of adjacent. <laughs> we will be talking about meteor showers. We might be talking about supernova. Mm-hmm. As well, Just and we can't stop. Uh, gravitational lensing and something called the cosmic distance duality relation, which <laughs> is really cool. I don't, is there a movie really named that? Because <laughs> that would be an interesting. Also, probably good. not very successful movie. You uh, could uh, you could call it something along those lines, though. We'll come up with a good movie title. Cosmic distance duality relation. Work on yeah, some we'll subset of those thing. words, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and ancient aurora. Cosmic duality condition. That's pretty good. <laughs> but first, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by Quadrans Muralis. Obviously. While the International Astronomical Union may not consider Quadrans Muralis to be a constellation, the IAU does not have the greatest reputation when it comes to categorizing what gets to be called what? Am I right, Pluto? <laughs> Le Mural, its original nom du ciel, is home to the radiant of the Quadrantids bringing you a meteor shower of origin from near-Earth object and extinct comet 2003 EH1. While they may not be as flashy as those easy cometary showers, such as the Perseids, the Quadrantids are the only meteor shower to boast a home in a banished and forgotten constellation, Quadrans Muralis. The mural, now subsumed by the sillily named... (laughs) Booties. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great name. Is happy to bring you the annual Quadrantids Meteor Shower in this episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Quadrans Muralis, Think Small. IBM. The IBM, Think Small? Uh, for microprocessors? Yeah. Jim? Think Small. Uh, Lego. <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah, you lost me. VW. Oh, they just had an ad the other day. That was very cute. It was about like the history of the bug. The bug. And it, this, of course, the Think Small was it probably. Was, I think that the, was a sign that they showed for in the Beetle. In it. Yeah, it was for the Beetle. 1959. Uh, so yes, tonight hmm. Quadrans Morales is sponsoring the show because tonight, as we record this, January 3rd, unfortunately, probably before dear listeners are hearing this oh, news, but it's it, not going to help them if you're. Hearing it now, we'll you know it, to follow us on our Twitter and Facebook and all our social media because we're putting that information out there in a timely fashion. In a timely fashion. Uh, is the peak of this relatively unusual meteor shower because it's very short-lived in time. Uh, each year it happens, but usually those meteor showers stretch out for a couple of days. Right. And this one is like a few hours. Mm. And that's just because of the geometry of the Earth and the orbit. We'll talk about that when we learn a little bit more about meteor showers and one of our topics coming up. Um, we have Earth news and space news and nerd news. Yay! Space we news. Uh, what's uh, he, living here in Central Florida? It's always a fun time to talk about launches coming up. Yes. And uh, Monday, January sixth, is the next launch of. Of SpaceX and they're launching Starlink satellites again. Another sixty? I think so. Yeah. These are these internet miniature internet bringing satellites that they're going to have a thousand or maybe forty thousand of. <laughs> you know, if you're one launching sixty at a time, it's going to take a long time to get forty thousand of them up there. True. Yeah. But um, they're popping rockets up. 
pretty frequently. Yeah. Um, and they're reusing their first stage, and so I don't know. Let, this would be a good yeah, prediction game. Yeah, I saw some crazy statistic like that was like they only have to make a couple of more, like a th- even though they're planning on SpaceX is planning on doing like a hundred launches or something this year, they only have to make like ten more boosters or something because of the success rate that they because they've had. got all these used boosters yep. ready to go. Yeah, and they and the one the new ones they make they'll fly six That's or seven the whole times. That's their whole business model. Yeah, right. yeah, right. It's, it's super cool. Yeah. I think supposedly these Starlink satellites are going to be painted differently, so they're hopefully less reflective, um, less reflective, less bothersome to astronomers yeah. and astronomy like-minded folk. Yeah. Um, we should have a betting pool. Open oh, yeah. to our listeners for how many Starlink satellites will be in orbit at the end of 2020. Use your 2020 vision <laughs> to predict how many Starlink satellites will be in orbit. I think 120 have been launched. How ballpark. Many, how many times is that joke going to be made this year? Uh, yeah, I, didn't I it. made it first. I'm sure you did. I'm sure I didn't. <laughs> uh, uh, how many have been launched so far? 120, Two, right? 120. Yeah, yeah. but and like sev- the first one was pretty some of them low success rate yeah. for staying in orbit, I think. I think it was but like on the order of 100 orbit. are up there. Yes. Already 60 planned for launch on January 6th. Yep. I know they're saying they need something like 800 to 1,000 for the system to be something that can be commercially operational or viable. To be fully and, operational. And then they want to All ramp, like, the, like the Death Star yeah. in Return That's of the Jedi. That's what I was referencing. Yeah. So... That'll be a game. We'll post that on our on our thing. Um, yeah. Any other space news? I don't think there's any other launches coming up right away. Uh, Earth news. The Everybody Earth is on fire. Yeah. Uh, particularly the Australian part of the Earth. Yeah, that's unfortunate. It's uh, like some it, crazy wildfires have been going since what September or something. It's uh, and it's still Basically. the beginning of the peak fire season there. It's the summer in yeah. Australia, uh, an area the size of the state of West Virginia. Uh, for those of our listeners familiar with U.S. states, it's pretty big. Uh, has burned. How does that compare in size to some of the like campfire and some it's of the other way, fires? Way, way, way. Several more. times yeah. larger than all of the fires in California last year wow. put together already. Yeah. yeah. And but uh, the part that we want to talk about is the cool weather phenomenon that are associated with that. Yeah. That's true. It'd yeah. be easy to talk about all the miserable aspects of it. Yeah. And, yeah. And w- but not. But yeah, but yeah, we wanted to talk about. But this is not the miserable astronomy. As, as, <laughs> no. as science and weather nerds, yeah. as folks who like tropical storms and cool weather phenomena, it's interesting to see that there's like these crazy weather phenomena that are associated just with these giant wildfires. Right. So they have. Um, so when the smoke creates these plumes, it creates these giant plumes that go up in the air, and they actually generate their own weather. So they can generate their own clouds. What are they called? Pyrocumulus clouds. Yeah, so fire plus cumulus <laughs> clouds. Right, that's insane. That's I'd crazy. never heard of that before a few days ago when, when that first started. So yeah, is, exactly. is the idea that the ash from the fire forms the nucleation sites for the water droplets yeah. in the upper atmosphere? Yeah, and you're like, oh, that's probably great because then and the it, fires and are and creating clouds. it warms clouds. everything, yeah, I mean, it, it causes everything to shoot up, you know, yeah. to rise very, very quickly, and then whatever water there is then condenses on those ash pits. And you're like, oh, that's great. It's going to make rain. But apparently it's then too hot underneath so that even the rain that starts to fall evaporates. out of those clouds exactly. evaporates before it can hit the ground or right. anything like it's that. It's actually bad. Worse for the fires because then there's a lot of lightning associated with that that starts more fires. Yeah, right. the yeah, exactly. lightning generated by essentially friction of all these water droplets rubbing against each other in some sense. And great. Yes. Yeah. So it can create additional like weather phenomena and additional winds that are generated by some of these things right. and lightning and all of the things that are very, very, and even more dryness, which is all very, very bad for Acc- us. Accidental geoengineering yeah. Uh, yeah. in some sense. And uh, some of the uh, discussions about what to do if, um, if and when the global warming gets really bad involves geoengineering of like putting tiny particles in the Earth's upper atmosphere to uh, uh, essentially mm. prevent some solar energy from reaching. Yeah. Ah, but that, I'm sure that'll work exactly as planned. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. Um, Nerd News, Jim, you've recently become an Expanse fan. Yay! Oh, the Expanse is great. Uh, I think we'll talk about it more often on the show. And we're going to hope to get to talk about it now? Because Jim will talk about I've, it more Because I've been talking about it, and therefore it's going to be a thing. No. Because <laughs> um, I hadn't ever talked about we've it. We've mentioned it a few times, of course, because <laughs> one of the cool things about the Expanse is that it's not always, but often scientifically well done. 
pretty pretty often. Yeah. Pretty often. Um, and I was this was just something I randomly noticed on the show uh, on the episode I watched last night. In essentially every science fiction you ever see, uh, the thrusters are always pointing away from the direction they're going. Uh, but of course, if you really want to get somewhere fast, what you do is accelerate half the time towards the thing you're going, and the other half of the time in the opposite direction to slow down. To slow so down, you don't go zipping by it when you get there. That's right. So you speed up as as much as you can halfway through the trip, and then flip the ship around and slow down the rest of the time. You're of course still going toward the object, but you're you're exerting a force. Oh, I know exactly way. where you are in the show. <laughs> how, mu- how much time do we spend in physics one trying to explain to students that See, velocity and acceleration, velocity and acceleration are different, sign. and they can have op- right exactly, and they do it right. So, in quick this. spoiler alert, then don't if you haven't seen season three. Oh yeah, don't give me a spoiler. No, you're gonna say it. No, oh, no, I'm oh, not gonna say. Not gonna I'm just gonna it. say that they do that in the show. They're like they're they're going a big distance. They do exactly that, and they show. Like, as they show a fleet of, of ships approaching an object, the, the thrusts, even though the looks, ship is still going like toward the to object, yeah, it looks like they're trying to get away, but they are going towards it, just slowing down, because that's what you'd have to do. And they even talk about doing, like, a, a sudden flip and burn. Right, like, where they, they do that need in the to middle decelerate of the... really quickly, and so they all have to be super prepared for it, right. and they have these, like, high G meds that they have to take. Yeah, right. It's cool. Lots of times you can use real physics and science as a dramatic element. To add drama. Oh, yeah. And they do that a lot with gravity stuff in The Expanse. So yeah. bravo to the uh, to the writers and science advisors of the expanse. I know exactly. What Jim is very excited on. that the velocity was positive and the acceleration was. I know. Positive. I know. Yes. I know. I guess I'm so excited. I'm going to use that in my class mm-hmm. this semester. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about meteor showers, meteor storms, uh, and I think we agreed none of us has seen a meteor storm at least, mm-hmm. and we've nah. seen the occasional meteor. And it's very hard to actually see these well. Because the night skies are so bright for most people. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, um, we live in Orlando. The Orlando skies, of course, are bad. I mean, Florida skies right. in general, but Orlando skies specifically. But uh, any of you that live in dark places, you get to see. So the, the Quadrantids, mm-hmm. which gets its name from this no longer a constellation, but the, the, the name of meteor just, showers. You I just figured it's from some quadrant in the sky. <laughs> no, it was, it was, it was a. Um, it was a constellation proposed in the 18th century. By some French people, apparently? Uh, yes. Uh, called the Mural, mm-hmm. uh, which was then Latinized as the Mural Quadrant. And it's, uh, it was abandoned by the IAU when they drew up their official list of 85 or 88, however many official uh, constellations we have now. Mm-hmm. It's sort of in between the Big Dipper and Booties. <laughs> Booties. <laughs> Which there's a there's an umlaut over one of the O's. The second yeah. O has an umlaut. Yeah. Booties is what my computer said to me. And uh, so it doesn't really have any bright stars. Is the thing is what doomed yeah. Quadrans, Morales, and you know, 88's enough constellations anyway. But the meteor yeah, showers man, can't get, have that many. People. Meteor showers happen when the Earth is like passing through some debris field in space. So th- think about. The Empire Strikes Back and the Millennium Falcon the asteroids. Then forget that because mm-hmm. that doesn't have anything to do with reality. <laughs> but then imagine that all those asteroids are tiny, tiny dust particles, and the Millennium Falcon's the Earth. And as the Earth plows through it, those dust particles rain into the atmosphere and they burn up, and they look like they're coming from the direction that the Earth is moving in the sky, which is towards some particular constellation. And that constellation then gives its name. And the sort of more pedantic or the more normal way we think about that, right, is that like if you're driving in a snowstorm or here in Florida, if you're driving in some sort of rainstorm, maybe during a tropical storm, and you're driving into, even though if the rain can be coming from different directions, but if you're driving fast enough, you're driving into it, it all looks like it's coming at you from one radiant, from one direction. So the radiant for the meteor shower tonight is Mm -hmm. Boodies, formerly Quad something Quadrant Morales. Of Morales. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. And, <laughs> and so that's in the northern part of the sky. Great. Uh, little, uh, so look towards the north if you're uh, able to. If you go back in time and listen you, to this. Right. <laughs> or next, or in January yeah, 2021. That's true. Because what happens is on. <laughs> every, every year the earth goes through that cloud. And then it'll be bigger or smaller depending on how close the actual parent object mm-hmm. of that dust is to us when we're going through it because there's more of that dusty material near that parent object. And it's only recently that the origin of this particular meteor shower was Ooh. identified. Um, 
Which little... is pretty fascinating, right? That like we've known about meteor showers and things like that, and and there's some very specific ones that we know about that happen certain times a year. And so you'd think that most of their origins would have been known for longer. It just, I, I mean, it but depends on how long the the comet's orbit exactly. is, right? If for shorter yeah. period comets, it's going to be easy because we know where they are. Yeah. But long period comets. Right. Mm. So this find. one, this one comes from uh, something that's only identified in 2003 mm -hmm. by Peter Jeniskins at uh, NASA Ames. He's a big Peter, uh, meteor. I said Peter. <laughs> <laughs> He's, <laughs> He's a Peter. Uh... Peter meteor. Uh, uh, minor planet 2003 EH1. Mm. So it doesn't even we have, know it well. Doesn't even have a name. Oh. And it's the source of meteor shower for us. It may be uh, the extinct comet seen in the 15th century. C fourteen ninety. Oh, also also not a, great a classic. Name. <laughs> right. Anyhow, a little tiny thing out there that looks like an asteroid now, but it may be an extinct comet that dumped a bunch of stuff in its orbit. And every January third, second, third, or fourth, the Earth goes through that train. And if we're lucky, we'll see some meteors. But there's another more well-known meteor shower uh, that we see every year that also had some news recently. Yeah, Geminids. The Geminids from Gemini. Yeah. So what was the cool news? Uh, again, the identification of the source body for the parent body for those particles. And I think we had suspected this one for a while. Yes. Um, but I, was, I, I, I am an idiot, so I don't know that much about this stuff. But when I saw this, I was very surprised. Why were you surprised? Because it's like an asteroid. Yeah. It is like an asteroid. It is like an Not asteroid. Not just like an asteroid. It's it an asteroid. It is an asteroid. But, but, it, but you know, so this I, you is know the, the, the Astronomy 101 on. version of this is that all these meteor showers are... The result of us going through the path of a comet, because mm -hmm. comets, when they come close to the sun, they heat up and the ices sublimate and they carry dust off with them, so they're active when they're close to the sun. Uh, asteroids are supposed to be just big rocks that don't do that. That don't do anything. That being said, we do know that asteroids do make debris tails when they have collisional events and right. things Ooh. like that. Right. And so there also, are people who track like solar system dust trails, dust bands that are right. created by asteroids that have broken apart and the dust bands get spread out in the solar system. Also, the cool Bennu. Yeah. Maybe it's like Bennu spitting out particles. Bennu, the asteroid that Osiris Rex has had, has been observed actually spitting pebbles out into space. Yeah. We don't know how don't or why. why. And it had a bad snack and it spit it it's out. Like <laughs> get away from me. There must be ices under there, yeah? There's That's probably, yeah, I mean, there's hypo different hypotheses, right? So there's, but none of them is like a slam dunk. Like right. People have been heavily researching this in the last year and there's no, like, oh, this mechanism works perfectly. It yeah. doesn't correlate with the sun shining on it exactly right, right for that to be like a slam dunk. Anyway, it is cool that these two parent bodies of these two meteor showers are the only two known to come from a non-comet. In the course of the quadrantids, mm -hmm. it may be an extinct comet, but mm -hmm. Phaethon doesn't really look like yeah. a, a cometary object at all. Yeah, maybe something happened to it. But and the other, one of the other cool things about this sort of confirmation is that it came from the Parker Solar Probe, which right. is actually intended to study the sun, as its name implies, but it sees these dust streams. It can see some of the faint dust that's pretty like closer to the sun or at different places in uh, the orbit around the sun. So it actually was confirmed with some imaging from PSP, which is pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, and the, um, the reason it was able to confirm that is because the source body for the Geminids, this mm -hmm. asteroid called Phaethon, trivia, uh, free, oh, trivia free trivia, is the, oh. uh, is the named object that comes closest to the sun. Oh, really? So of all the objects in the solar system, like we mentioned 2003 EH1 is the source for that, that other thing. That doesn't count as named. That's not a name, right? <laughs> Phaethon is a name. Uh, not the most pronounceable name. It's, it's the episode of unpronounceable names. Apparently, <laughs> uh, is com title comes uh, less than twenty percent of the distance of the Earth from the Sun to the Sun, and the Parker Solar Probe is in there, nice. so it has a chance to sort of see that mm -hmm. debris of dust really along Actually the orbit, orbit of that object. Yeah, um, that object's classified as a near Earth object and potentially hazardous. Ooh. Comes uh -oh. within a comes within a few percent. Shoot it down. Of a fuh, the uh, it comes within a few percent of the Earth Sun distance of the Earth as its sort of minimum approach. 
we're not in any danger from it in, in the foreseeable future, but there's a couple. I think in the unforeseeable future, we I might be. I think mm. there's a mission that's going to one of the upcoming proposed missions wants to study Phaethon too. Phaethon has been an object of interest precisely for what Jim was saying is that this is this weird asteroid that seems to be active somehow. It's kind of bluish. It gets very close to the sun, so it gets very hot. Bluish. Over a thousand uh, Kelvin. Oh yeah, it's, Destiny Plus is the name of that one. Yeah. So uh, with that, Ooh, that transitions us nicely into top court trivia. <gasps> top court trivia. Ooh. This is a mini park trivia. Just, just because. <laughs> Sorry, they won't be long How though. Many? They're all short. So mm. <laughs> we're talking about the uh, source of the Geminid meteor shower, named of course for the constellation Gemini. So this is going to be a constellational True. trivia. Oh great! Uh, and we were just talking about constellations and that kind of thing. And there we are were. There are eighty-eight total of them. So of those eighty-eight. For part one of the question is, of those 88, how many border Gemini? Oh. Hmm. Interesting. So think about that. Mm. And, uh, oh, that's, I guess I can't do the second part of it without Whoa. ruining the first part of it. So, okay. All right, you're okay. going to what? You're going to answer the first part now, and then yeah. I'll leave the second part as the, main the thing one. to think about. Okay. Okay. So how many constellations, constellations. border Gemini? Is that's it a one. Tennessee or is it like a Colorado? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go with, uh, I'll blurt out a guess. Okay. Eight. I'm going to go with four. All right. Josh, right on the nose. It is eight <gasps> constellations so that great. border Gemini. As I said, I knew this very well. It was not a guess. And it's, <laughs> I got it right because yes, of my he, encyclopedic yeah. exactly. knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. He could see the constellations could, in his head. He's got this like photorealistic yes. uh, yes. memory. As I said. Um, okay, so if he ahead. does, then he should be able to answer this following question as well. Great. Uh, which of the following constellations does not border Gemini? Oh. Okay. oh. <laughs> and then there'll be more scientific questions after, the, after oh this at the end. Um, which of the following constellations does not border Gemini? A. Cancer. B, Lynx, C, Auriga, which I may be mispronouncing, D, Sextans, E, Perseus, F, Taurus, G, Orion. It's too many choices. H, Monoceros, you can't go to H. or I, Canis Major. I can. I can't on a Scantron, but I can here. There, ha there are eight, so I have, to, I have to have nine in my list. No, you don't. No, you don't. Oh, that's true. I didn't. <laughs> you could oh. have four that do border it and one that doesn't. Oh, I'm and so just stupid. Leave off. Okay. I'll narrow the list down. <laughs> Thanks, because I'll just cut track. it. I'll cut it to the first five that I said: Cancer, okay. Lynx, Auriga, Sextans, or Perseus. One of those does not border okay. Gemini. Well, I have, okay. I'll ask you to repeat those when we come back okay. to the answer. Okay. Now let us zoom in our magical and ethereal way in our spaceship, spaceship of discovery. Of what is it called? Of the imagination. Spaceship of the imagination out to the. Outer reaches of the universe. I feel oh. like I feel like we have to name our own spaceship, though. We do. Oh, that would be so much fun. The Astrocorks need to have a spaceship. We should have a name. Okay. All right. We'll work on that. <laughs> We're open to suggestions. It's true. Um, we don't want it to be like spaceship mixed space space though. No, not space. <laughs> yeah, we're not, space, space, not space, actually space, opening space, up space, to voting uh, for the internet. Good. No, we're will. not opening up to <laughs> voting. We're just open to suggestions, and we're we reserve the right to reject those suggestions. <laughs> What's um, so I think the topic we're going to talk about here for a bit, this is this is a topic that is near and dear to my own heart. Oh, the board is empty. Is, but uh, is distances. Yes. Measuring distances <laughs> to things. Jim is excited about two things. <laughs> one is if a velocity and acceleration have opposite signs. <laughs> I know, that's such a good episode. That one is really exciting. <laughs> it's so exciting. And second, distances. Distances. <laughs> um, because I'm excited because dis it's not nearly, and we've talked about this on previous episodes, but it's how do you measure the distance to things? It's not nearly as obvious as it seems, right? You can't put rulers down and measure the distance to Andromeda or something like that. We were or just even talking, the moon. That's true. Or even the moon. You guys shoot lasers at it to right. measure that. Right. So things that are close, there are reasonably straightforward ways to do it. And like Eddie just said, if you want to measure the distance to the moon, shoot a laser at the moon, bounce the laser off the moon, or radar or something like that, bounce it off the moon, time how long the light takes to get there and back, and you know very precisely how far away the moon is. Uh, but it's hard to put down retroreflectors on things that are much farther away than the moon. Right. True. But you can you still can use, use radar. radar. Uh, yes. So, so they, they call, it's called radar ranging that they use to find the distance to nearby things or laser ranging. Um, to things that are a little farther away, you can still use geometry and the Earth's motion around the sun 
uh, and ge uh, stellar parallax, or, the or not just effect. or any kind of uh, parallax. That is, you know, things appear to shift their position in the sky as we move around the sun. Yeah, just like your finger appears to shift if you switch from your left eye to your right eye or something like that. That's that tells you how far away your finger is if you know your geometry and your trigonometry well, and enough, the distance between can, your eyes. I can. My nose moves a lot when I. Right. Close my left right. eye, my right eye. But this starts eyes. to fail as things get far away, right? Take If you take your finger at, at arm's length, its shift is just a little bit. Uh, and if you took your finger and moved it a mile away, it would not appear to shift at all. Because I'd be in the ER. <laughs> we, just <talked> about <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we just talked last episode about how we don't even know the distance to... Right, to Beetlejuice to or Beetlejuice. something like that, right? Yeah. As well as we think we should. Right. So but even that is not can. that great. But then what about something that's really far away, like another galaxy... Uh, or you know. far, far away. Yeah, yeah. All of these things are far. Well, we've talked about ways of of doing this. I just want to talk about it generally. Uh, a couple of ways of doing. It. We've talked about standard candles, right? Was one. What is a standard candle? A standard candle is Vanilla. if is if I know <laughs> it's ocean. Pretty standard. If it's I pretty if standard. I see a light bulb and I know from what it looks like that it's a hundred watt light bulb. Mm -hmm and then I can see that it's really dim, I know that it's really far away. Right. But if it's really bright, I know it's really close. That's right. But I have to know that that is a 100 watt light bulb because maybe the light bulb is a neon light that says, I'm 100 watts. Right. It's a liar. Right. But here's the thing. It's like a supernova. Unfortunately, in cosmology, it's not even as easy as that. <gasps> It's Darn not it's even as easy as a neon light <laughs> that says, I'm 100 watts. Right. Even if you have a, a thing that says, I'm 100 watts, <laughs> you still don't actually know how far away it is. What you can determine is this thing called the luminosity distance, uh, which is how far that thing would be away mm -hmm. if, if we lived in a universe that wasn't expanding right. and uh. that was spatially flat. And the space wasn't curved oh. and the universe wasn't expanding. <laughs> Unfortunately... It's neither one of those things, complicated potentially. Complicated universe. And so it becomes compl so 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 when we can, if we have a standard candle, we can measure the distance to that standard candle. Kind of, we can measure the luminosity distance, but that's not the actual that's, distance. That's it's like the a distance, distance with an saying. asterisk. Right, right. right. Mm. Uh, and then there's another kind of thing you could do. Another here's another uh, kind of way to measure the distance to a thing is a thing called a standard ruler. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So like, uh, and this is. Yeah, or a standard yardstick. That is, if you had an object that you knew was one meter, then you just see how much of your sky does it take up, right? So if you have a if you have a meter stick and stick it right in front of your face, it's taking up like your entire field of view, like 180 degrees of the sky, right? Mm -hmm. If you take that same yardstick and put it, you know, half a mile away, it's this tiny little thing, right? Mm -hmm. right. And so my my favorite standard ruler analogy is airplanes. Airplanes. And Why? Well, because 747s are like twice as big as most jets. Okay. And that's why they always look like they're going scarily slowly. Right. Mm -hmm. Because your brain sees it and says, oh, airplane. Mm -hmm. I know how big an airplane is. I meant subconsciously mentally figure out it's this far away, mm -hmm. but it's really twice as far away because it's twice as big. So it looks like it's going half as fast oh, right. as a regular, you know, 720, 737. See, we learn things about things on this awesome. podcast, too. Um, also, I live underneath the flight path. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so if you find a, the, so if you have an object that you know its physical size, you know the diameter of this object, and then you can calculate what's called the angular diameter distance to the object. That's a longer name. It's yeah. unfortunate. I know we don't this have jargon on the program, but... That has the little dagger, not to the asterisk next to it. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, that's two different ways of finding distances to things. But again, that is also not the actual distance that you'd find doing that. Damn because it, Jim, again, just tell us the answer. Jim, how far away is it for Christ's <laughs> sake? <laughs> but here's the thing. If you it's measure... Further away than this explanation. Here's the fun thing. If you have an object and you have one of those two distance measures, so mm -hmm. you have the luminosity distance, and you also measure the redshift of the thing, oh. then uh, you can translate, and you know the, the geometry well, of the Well, the universe. redshift is another distance measurement somehow. It's no, so well, no. I mean, it's... I guess it's... Yeah, okay. The redshift is how much, how fast it's How fast away. it's moving away from you. Uh, and so if you have that, or it's related to how fast it's moving away if you have that... With an asterisk <laughs> next to it. <laughs> and... Double asterisk. One of these distances, then you can find out the actual distance to the object. Can you? Um, Without an asterisk but here would be a really, Here would be a really cool situation. What if you had an object that you could measure both the luminosity distance to and the angular diameter distance that to. That sounds amazing. 
I That's think. two different ways of measuring the distance to it. Uh -huh. And you can measure the redshift of these things. It uh -huh. turns out that there is a relationship between those three things. Is it the cosmic duality, cosmic distance duality relation? You know, when you when you sent that to me earlier, I, I've never heard that term in my life. That's just not ever referred to like that. <laughs> uh, you can, or at least in this part of the world, I think the, the authors of this paper are Chinese, and it's possible that in China they refer to it that way. Oh. Uh, we generally do not, but it's it's like standard textbook. What do we refer to it as? It's not. Referred to as anything, it's oh, not it's just a. So now know. maybe we should call it. That. <laughs> maybe we should call it that. Uh, but it's a. But but if you could measure those two distances and the redshift, redshift, then you could determine if they are in fact related in the way that our equations say they're related. And the reason that's cool is that tells you are your equations correct, right? This is the whole point of science: is we want to know so those our equations. theoretical uh, predictions based on general relativity and. So those equations are handling the asterisk and the dagger, namely the expansion of the universe, the non-flatness of space-time. Yep, you're handling all of those so things. So all that thing is wrapped up in there, which is what is making those distances not as simple as they That's right. neon sign. Okay. But there is, a, but there's, yeah, there's and a beautiful relationship between those things, and if it holds true, then that means are we right? We're we're on the right track. Our, our version of the universe, our understanding of the fundamental universe, is right. Mm -hmm. Are we? Unfortunately, that's really hard to test. Oh! Uh, the paper that, that we, were, we were reading earlier today is a theory paper. Is a theory paper. Oh. Um, it is, but it's proposing uh, an experimental uh -huh. test. Because uh -huh. here's the trouble. So There's not a lot of things. There, there are some things that I know how bright they are, so I can measure their luminosity distance. There are some things that I know how big they are, mm -hmm. and I, but there are precious few things that I know both of those pieces of information about. Right. Um, and this uh, a new paper is proposing a way to actually do that. It turns out if you have like a neutron star neutron star collision like we've talked about on the program that produces gravitational waves uh -huh. yes and those gravitational waves are lensed by some object in between me and that event uh -huh. that you can use that you can find out both the luminosity and angular diameter distance to this thing how, and test this how do we measure that lensing oh, though that's it's very challenging Gra yeah. yeah gravitational lensing without going down the rabbit hole is it's, it's that the, it's, it's matter distorts space? It distorts space. But here's the thing: but, but but light travels in straight lines. So as space is distorted, light bends around the thing. It's like when you put a roundabout in the middle of a road. Right. But also, right. uh, <laughs> but this bending of space also bends gravitational waves. So both gravitational waves and light waves travel the same path, this distorted path around the object. And then you see more than one version of that background object. Uh, so in the case of this thing, like we, see, we would see more than one gravitational wave event, right? Like we see those things at LIGO. We see, oh, here's a gravitational wave passing. You'd see it passing twice, uh, and it'd be the same event. Uh, and if you could do that and get light from that object, then you could do all of this stuff, and we could test whether we're right about the nature of the universe. So okay, unfortunately, so LIGO can't do it. I'll get on oh. it. Yeah, I'm on Will it. Will Lisa be able to do it? Lisa I, won't be able to do it, uh. but the Einstein telescope might be able to do it. This is going to be like a third generation. I'll do it. That's OK. Yeah. I, don't have, I don't have anything else you got, this You got nothing going on this weekend? I got nothing, all right. nothing going on this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> My schedule's clear for the next day or two. Fair Perfect. Enough. Okay. Fair enough. Cool. Um, before we get to parts two through five of Jim's <laughs> trivia, uh, there was some cool little Earth news about ancient aurora. Oh, yeah. Uh, so aurora are what we see in the, we have the northern and southern aurora, the aurora. Borealis and Australis. Correct. Australis oh, for southern, one. Borealis for northern. You didn't know Australis? I did know it. I was going to let you get Borealis. Oh. oh. Borealis. And I'm going to get Australis. <laughs> Um, anyway. But so and so those are those are set by the fact that um, charged particles that stream in from the sun tend to spiral along the magnetic fields of the earth and those tend to come in sort of near the poles. They sort of it's where the pole the magnetic field lines reconnect with the earth. And so particles stream in and they hit the atmosphere. They're high energy particles, they hit the atmosphere, they make it glow, right? They ionize it and make it glow. Yeah. So that's why we see uh, a aurora. Like a neon sign. Like a neon sign. Yes, indeed. Have either of you guys actually seen the aurora? No. I've seen a terribly faint disappointment pointing glow through the window of an airplane on a transatlantic flight. Oh, yeah. Flight. yeah. I asked you this question before, yeah. The only but time I've I done, haven't. when I could have seen it maybe when I was at high enough on a flight, it was daytime. Mm. Yeah. So, no. Okay. And in Colorado, we there was one time that we could maybe we were going to see yeah, it. It was but cloudy. It was cloudy. Oh. <laughs> Astro Cork road trip yeah. to Excellent. Alaska. Yeah. And the magnetic North Pole is like racing yeah, away from us. It just crossed the prime meridian or something. It's now technically in the other hemisphere. Yeah. Oh, we, we talked before about how it's, it moves slightly, but it's moving yeah, super fast right now it. for some reason. It's yeah. probably a bad sign. Um, I know. It well, it could just mean that it's going to flip soon. 
which is which would be, it would and be Beetlejuice weird. is gonna go supernova. Oh gosh. Oh, oh god. Um, so anyway, so but so th- this is relevant, right? So that the, the the North Pole does move, and so back in the day, it used to be a little bit further south. Um, I think in like toward uh, places where people used to live. So this is in like 600, 600 between six hundred eighty and six hundred fifty BCE. There are recordings from um, some Assyrian tablets that record a red glow or red covering the sky. So they oh. think they had aurora that they could see in the sky around that time. In the and Middle so East. In, in the, the Middle East. So this was in like Babylon, um, which is in Iraq, and uh, Nineveh, which is also near, also in Iraq. Cool. Um, and it's not because the poles were that far south. It's because there was probably a big space weather event, like a big solar flare or CME or something, that caused the aurora to go further south than they usually do, CME but even being that far south. A coronal mass ejection and yes. a whole bunch of, a of charged energy. particles coming out from the sun mm-hmm. and dumped into the magnetic dumped field. Dumped into the magnetic field. And there's some carbon 14 <coughs> dating that shows um, that maybe there, that also shows in tree rings that there was some high energy event at that time. Yeah. So it's probably some sort of early space weather solar storm event. Awesome. Hmm. So we can track them. This is the farthest back that yes. we'll be able to track it. There will be more of those on tap in the future for sure. space weather events. Yeah. All right, Jim. And now we have to worry about technology. They didn't have to right. worry about the rocks. Right. Yeah, if we get they, a serious, serious event the, like that, we're going to be in trouble. The papyrus will, tablets survived that space yes. weather event. <laughs> right. We will not be broadcasting if no. there's a serious space weather event. No. Um, all right. Here's the abbreviated Here it is, list. The abbreviated list. Which of the following constellations does not border Gemini? Okay. Cancer, mm-hmm. Lynx, Auriga, Sextans, or Perseus? Does not border Gemini. You get to go first this time. Sextans. Well, I'm pretty sure Cancer does because I think that's the zodiacal constellation immediately mm-hmm. after Gemini. Clever. Good. Uh, I can't use cleverness for any of the others, and so I'm going to go with the only one that I had never actually heard of before in that list, which is Lynx. Lynx? Yeah. Uh, uh, I was going to call you Zoe, but your uh, actual <laughs> he name is he Addie. Called me, he called Zoe Addie earlier today, so it's <laughs> Weird. a reversal. Uh, you've got it, Addie. It's Sextons. Yeah, because that's in the Southern Hemisphere. It is oh. not. Oh. It is not actually that far away. It's oh. just a, a couple constellations over. I put it in there because I wanted to say sex. Nah. Se- the, um, but it, it's named after an astronomical st- tool. Sex. Star, <laughs> stars in sextons uh, were observed by the instrument that I worked on on Cassini. Oh, wow. As they were occulted by Saturn and Saturn's rings. And so I, oh, as, nice. when I was designing mm-hmm. the observations, our code names Alpha. for the observations were the first three letters of the particular star in the constellation, then the first three letters of the constellation name. Mm-hmm. So That's we very observed common in astronomy. Alp Sex. <laughs> so I was doing a lot of. Cassini planning missions where I was really just saying sex. I wasn't sex. saying sextons. Sex. Nice. All right. And um, I also wasn't 100% sure what the rest of the constellation was, so I'm just like, Alpha Sex? Alpha sex. <laughs> All right, quick quick follow-ups. Kay. You guys know the answer to this. Okay. What are the two brightest stars in Gemini? Castor and Pollux. <sighs> Excellent. Castor and Pollux, the twins, the twins. for which Gemini is named. From Con Air. Which one is brighter? Oh. Uh, Castor. Uh... Caster. Well, it's Pollux. Pollux. You, Pollux both, you suck. Like you both suck. <laughs> I was going to say but Caster. The last bit is, figured, okay. what's weird about that? Why is Caster, why is it weird that Caster is why brighter is it weird than Pollux? That, no, Pollux is brighter. Why is it weird that Pollux is brighter? Because yeah. usually a brighter star will get named first. Uh, is one of them Alpha and the other Beta? Yes. And is Pollux Beta? Yes. That's, that's what, what I was saying. That's weird about it. That's what I was trying to say. Well, yeah, usually yeah. in a... Uh, but he had to give us that information for In us a constellation, uh, yeah, the way they name the star... I mean, that, there, there, it has many names. Castor and Pollux have the name Castor and Pollux, but they also go by the denomination of Alpha... Alpha Gem. But what is it? What is alpha the, Sex. It's not no, Sex. they're in, in the, Gemini. But what is the longer version of that? Gemini. Uh, it's Geminorum. Geminorum. What? Alpha Geminorum and Beta Geminorum are Pollux, or are, excuse me, Castor That's and Pollux, respectively. Is this a Usually, line? Alpha is the brightest star in the constellation, yeah. Beta is the second yeah. brightest, and yeah. so forth. Well, for Orion, the Betelgeuse, which we were talking about, which is mysteriously fading, yeah. and we're hoping Still it'll going. blow up, right. uh, is the brightest star in Orion, normally, Yep. but is Beta Orion, I think. Also, right. really? Somehow this gets weirded, but anyway. I think so. Random. Maybe they used to be dimmer when they were first named. Perhaps. Perhaps. Doesn't that maybe tell you that historically those were 
it was a dimmer star. Oh than no, I, I'm I'm completely false. Al uh, Betelgeuse is Alpha Orionis. Right. Right. Usually right. this brighter. Yeah. So, th but th that's that's why this is really the except uh, an exception. The brightest one should Just be Alpha. What kind of stars are they? I don't know. <sighs> All right. Berg. Cool. Dope. Berg. Well, while it may have felt like the time for light to cross the observable universe, it was just another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. If you liked this episode of Walk About the Galaxy, write us a review by moving a mass around so that it gravitationally bends your laser pointer light to write the review on the movie theater screen during the end credits of Star Wars Episode Nine. Be sure to like us on Facebook to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Walk About the Galaxy, where you can see three astroports with Walk About t-shirts on this episode only. Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to our listeners in Mexico and around the world. Follow us on Twitter. At walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions anywhere using hashtag walk about the galaxy. Our theme music was composed by Richard Drusick. Our production assistant and video guru is Diego Rodriguez. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. I'm Jim Cooney. We're the Astro Corks signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Hashtag fundamental.